the Red Army was pulling back across the Volga. Suddenly, enormous explosions ripped through the city behind them. The ammunition and fuel dumps in Rajev were being blown up to prevent them falling into enemy hands. Everywhere, there was confusion. The roads were crowded with retreating soldiers. No one knew where it would end. It seemed the whole front was collapsing. It was October 1941. The Germans had launched Operation Typhoon, the battle for Moscow. The German army was in Rajev, just hours behind the Soviets. An investigation into the conduct of Soviet commanders at Rajev cleared them of wrongdoing. There had been no way to get the ammunition out. The Luftwaffe had already destroyed all transport connections to the city. The Red Army ammunition dumps were at Rajev because the city lay at the heart of the rail network. Both sides depended on ammunition, food and fuel by the trainload. It made Rajev a valuable prize. Red Army units retreating from Rojev were reorganized into the Kalinin Front. Their new commander was Colonel General Ivan Stepanovich Konyev. Konyev was the son of Russian peasants and became a conscript of the Tsarist Army in 1916. By 1941, he'd risen to senior command and was put in charge of a front, the Soviet equivalent of an army group. However, his forces became encircled in the opening phase of Operation Typhoon. Konyev's conduct was investigated by the State Defense Committee, led by Molotov and Voroshilov. Konyev's predecessor, General Pavlov, had been shot following a similar investigation. But Konyev was saved by Zhukov's intervention. Zhukov knew any general could have a bad day. And shooting competent officers with the enemy at the gates of the capital was counterproductive. That winter, outside Moscow, the Red Army launched a massive counterattack. The German 9th Army was forced to retreat from Kalinin back to Rojev. Hitler's response was to sack Army Group Center's commander, Fedor von Bock. He was given just a few hours to brief his successor, Field Marshal von Kluger. Von Bock painted a bleak picture. He warned von Kluger that he believed the enemy was preparing a powerful strike against both flanks of Army Group Center. Gunther von Kluger had been promoted field marshal the previous year, following his success in the Battle of France. He came from a Prussian family with a long tradition of military service. In 1944, he would take his own life, following the failure of the army plot to assassinate Hitler. Von Bock's warning proved accurate. As Zhukov attacked from the east, Konyev's 39th Army broke through the German lines west of Rajev, threatening Army Group Center's supply lines. The Soviet 29th Army followed through the breach, threatening Rajev itself. The Germans clung on desperately. Heinrich Harper, a medic in the German 6th Infantry Division, described the chaos. We got reinforcements from construction companies and rear units. Many didn't know anything about handling weapons. They were cannon fodder thrown into the battle. While we changed positions after firing, the newcomers always shot from the same spot. 
One burst from a Russian machine gun was all it took. In 12 hours, from 130 new men, 26 were left. Konyev's counterattack encircled the German 23rd Corps near Olenina. But Zhukov's advance became bogged down in fighting around Yuknov. Only Bilov's cavalry corps broke through to Vyazma. Because of the almost total destruction of Red Army tank units in the first weeks of the war, by late 1941, the Soviets were forced to look elsewhere for fast-moving offensive units. They turned to their cavalry. The cavalry was used to exploit breakthroughs and attack enemy lines of communication. Each cavalry corps included one tank brigade, anti-tank guns and mortars. The cavalry were, in effect, mobile infantry. Horses got them there, but then the men dismounted to fight and the horses were led to the rear. Mounted cavalry charges were for the newsreels. Later in the war, the Red Army created cavalry mechanized groups containing cavalry, tanks, self-propelled guns and rocket artillery. These formations were powerful and highly mobile. On the 16th of January, General Strauss asked to be relieved as commander of the German 9th Army. His replacement was Walter Model. Model now turned the tables on the Soviets. First, he broke through to the isolated 23rd Corps. Then he cut off the Soviet 29th Army. Konyev launched ferocious counterattacks in a bid to rescue his trapped units. But Model successfully parried one blow after another. The Soviets failed to break through. Konyev ordered the encircled men to save themselves. On the 17th of February, a small airborne force was parachuted in to guide the troops back through the lines. 5,200 men of the 29th Army made it back. 14,000 did not. The Soviet plan to cut the smolensk vyazma highway, thereby cutting off German Army Group Center, had ended in a bloody failure. The losses were extraordinary, but casualty claims remain controversial. The Soviets admitted to a staggering 341,000 casualties on the Kalinin front. The Western Front suffered an additional 105,000 casualties, while German Army Group Center sustained an estimated 150,000 casualties. Summer 1942. The drone of a light aircraft could be heard over the forest and the occasional crack of a rifle. Field Marshal von Kluger was indulging in his new hobby, fox hunting from the air. It was a dangerous sport. Partisans and stranded Red Army soldiers hid in the forest. Model had recently been wounded by a lucky shot. After the winter fighting, many Soviet units were cut off behind the German front line. The front here had become a confusing patchwork of pockets and salients. The largest salient projected into the forests around the town of Zhukovsky. It contained parts of the Soviet 39th Army and 11th Cavalry Corps. They were supplied along a narrow corridor through enemy lines. Artillery officer Mikhail Lukinov described conditions. There weren't many of us, and no one was in good shape. All the horses had died. The sick and wounded were taken out on foot, and some of us envied them. The Stavka was not willing to give up any of its hard-won ground, no matter how exposed it left the troops. 
And now, disaster loomed. On the 2nd of July, the Germans launched Operation Seidlitz. Within three days, they had closed the corridor at the village of Pushkari. It meant the encirclement of the 39th Army, the 11th Cavalry Corps, and also parts of the 41st and 22nd Armies. Attempts to break out lasted for several days. Polyakov, a signals officer from a guard's rifle division, described the atmosphere. At headquarters, there was a sense of calm foreboding. You could sense people thinking, we've done all we can. Now duty demands we go to the very end. But while his troops fought bravely on, 39th Army commander General Maslenikov was evacuated by air. His injured deputy, General Ivan Bogdanov, was also flown out, but died of his wounds. 18,000 soldiers escaped the trap. More than 60,000 did not. Operation Seidlitz gave the Rzhev bulge its definitive shape. At its tip, the city of Rzhev and the junction of two rail arteries, one running east-west from Moscow to Veliki Luki, the other running north-south from Torzhok to Vyazma. German control of Rzhev prevented the Soviets moving men and supplies between the two flanks. But if Rzhev fell, the Red Army would be able to launch powerful offensives on both flanks. They would trap and destroy German forces in the salient. What's more, the German lines here were only 150 kilometers from the Soviet capital. It was imperative that Soviet forces drive the enemy as far from Moscow as possible. In July 1942, the Wehrmacht launched a new offensive in southern Russia to capture the Caucasus oil fields. The Red Army retreated towards Rostov and Stalingrad. Stalin issued his famous Order Number 227, not a step back. At the Rzhev salient, the fighting had settled into a routine of bombardments and small-scale raids. For the Eastern Front, this was what passed for a quiet patch. But it was the calm before the storm. The Soviets were preparing something big. B-4 guns, dubbed Stalin sledgehammers, had arrived at the front. The B-4 was a Soviet 203mm heavy howitzer. It was a fearsome weapon, used for smashing enemy fortifications and strong points. B-4 batteries were under the direct command of the Stavka Strategic Reserve, this meant that wherever they showed up, something big was being planned. The explosion of a 100 kilogram B-4 shell would instantly catch the Germans' attention. So to keep the presence of the heavy guns secret, gunners carried out their ranging fire with light howitzers. The results were then recalculated for the B-4s. But that wasn't all the Soviets were hiding. The new M30 rocket launcher was about to make its operational debut. M30s were similar to the famous Katyusha truck-mounted rocket launchers, but this version carried a heavier 300mm rocket with a bulbous warhead which meant the launcher had to be installed directly into the ground. Each M30 could be loaded with four or later eight rockets. It was a crude but devastating weapon, nicknamed Pounding Ivan by the troops. Each rocket had a range of 2.8 kilometers, 
Later in the war, an M31 rocket was developed with a range of more than four kilometers. It was fired from a car-mounted launcher known as Andriusha. The front line was quiet when Leonid Sandilov, chief of staff of the 20th Army, went to visit. On a clear day, you could see German guards changing shifts, smoke coming from dugouts, and soldiers bailing out their trenches with buckets. In the evenings, you could hear them playing their harmonicas. These routines were carefully observed by Red Army staff officers disguised as common soldiers. This sector near the Derja River had been chosen by the Stavka High Command for an ambitious operation. The orders from the Stavka were to seize control of the cities of Rezhev and Zubtsov, and then to advance to fortify the lines of the Volga and Vazuza rivers. The attack was to be made by two armies of the Kalinin Front and two armies of the Western Front. It would commence on the 28th of July, 1942. But the Germans were preparing their own offensive. The Germans planned to attack at Sukinishki, where there was a bulge in the front. Operation Whirlwind would be the classic German pincer move. Two blows from north and south to encircle Soviet troops in the bulge. Summer rainstorms turned roads into swamps. The Western Front's attack had to be delayed, but Konyev's Kalinin Front went ahead without them on the 30th of July. Its troops had been given two days to capture Rezhev. General Khladnikov, the Kalinin Front's artillery commander, reported the effects of his barrage. Two of the forward positions of the enemy's main defensive line were destroyed. The forces occupying them were almost completely wiped out. But Modol used the German 6th Infantry Division to plug any gaps that appeared in the line. Battles raged for days over villages and landmarks. To the north of Rezhev, Polonino village and Hill 200 were the focus of bitter fighting. A battalion commander from the 6th Infantry Division tried to describe the experience. Our trenches were under constant artillery and mortar fire. It's hard to imagine the sheer number of guns, the indescribable sound of the rockets. The wounded drag themselves to the rear. They say it's all bad in the front line. The Russians destroy our guns and are leveling our positions. But still, the Soviet infantry failed to break through. Soviet infantry tactics weren't helping. In 1942, Red Army doctrine stated that infantry should be drawn up in two echelons. For a division, this meant two regiments in the first echelon and one behind. Their battalions and companies were arranged in the same way. It allowed a division to move quickly to exploit a successful attack. It also meant that in a rifle division, only eight out of 27 companies were in the front line. Attacks were weakened, and units in the rear were exposed to shells and bombs long before they'd even engaged the enemy. In the bloody fighting around Rezhev, the Red Army would learn many painful lessons.
The 4th of August, 1942. The dawn silence was about to be broken by a deafening cannonade. Stalin's sledgehammers had joined the battle. Then, the Katyushas joined in. Five days late, Zhukov's Western Front had joined the battle. As Zhukov's troops advanced, they liberated their first Russian village. At Pegoroloi Gorodisha, they learned firsthand about the brutality of Nazi occupation. Jews had been murdered. Russians starved, or transported to the Reich as forced labor. From a population of 3,076, only 905 remained. In two days of slow and costly advances, the 20th Army reached the Vazuza and Gajat rivers. Now, it had to storm across them, take Sitchevka, and so cut the vital vyazma rozhev rail line. Modol hurriedly redeployed the five divisions, three of them armored, that had been earmarked for Operation Whirlwind. The attacking Red Army units were decimated. Zhukov was forced onto the defensive. He turned his attention to the village of Kamanovo on his left flank. It was a virtual fortress, protected by the Yalze River in front and impenetrable swamps on both flanks. For the Soviet infantry, it meant more suicidal frontal assaults. On the 21st of August, the Kalinin Front finally took Polonino and advanced to the outskirts of Rzhev. The Western Front managed to outflank Kamanovo. The village fell on the 23rd of August. Modol demanded that von Kluger release three more divisions to help shore up 9th Army's position. He got them. With these reinforcements and his skillful handling of the tactical situation, Modol was able to fight the Soviet offensive to a standstill. Red Army gains had fallen far short of expectations. Stalin now telephoned Zhukov at Western Front headquarters. He told him, you must report to the Stavka as soon as possible. Think carefully about who will take over from you there. Stalin was sending Zhukov south to oversee the defense of Stalingrad. Zhukov had named Ivan Konyev as his successor at Western Front headquarters. Konyev immediately ordered a new strategy. There would be no more attempts to cut the railway at Sitchevka. Instead, Konyev would concentrate all his resources on driving the Germans out of Rozhev. New offensives were launched in late August. Konyev seemed on the brink of victory. But once more, Modell received reinforcements in the nick of time.
They included the elite Großdeutschland Motorized Infantry Division. This unit exemplified the superior equipment, tactics and training still possessed by the German army. In October, the Soviets were forced to abandon their offensive. The Rezhev sector began to quieten down. That summer, Modal's 9th Army had lost 60,000 men. Soviet casualties were 314,000 men, more than five times as many. Red Army soldiers called it the Rezhev meat grinder. Alexander Bodner was in the midst of it. We'd never attacked in the summer before that, and we didn't know how to attack the summer German. I was a kilometer behind the front, and suddenly I saw a field covered with our dead. Young boys with guard badges, wearing brand new uniforms. The German machine gunner was just mowing them down. We were still learning how to fight from the Germans, right up until Stalingrad. But after Stalingrad, we had nothing to learn. We knew everything. The Russian poet, Alexander Trifonovich Tvadovsky, gave a voice to the dead. I was killed near Rezhev, in a nameless bog, in Fifth Company, on the left flank, in a cruel air raid. I did not hear the explosions and did not see the flash. Down to an abyss from a cliff, no start, no end. And in this whole world, till the end of its days, neither patches nor badges from my tunic you'll find. November 1942. At a Red Army Air Force base near Moscow, air crew rushed to inspect a brand new arrival. This sleek new twin-engine bomber was the Tupolev Tu-2. The Tu-2 was a high-speed bomber with a crew of four. It was armed with two 20mm cannon, three defensive machine guns, and could carry more than three tons of bombs. The designer, Andrei Nikolaevich Tupolev, worked for the aviation design bureau known as OKB-29. They were based at 24 Radio Street, Moscow, where they were closely supervised by the NKVD secret police. Most Soviet wartime designers and engineers worked under similar supervision by the authorities, some whilst under actual arrest. The Germans still held Rezhev and the crucial rail hub. It made it difficult to resupply the Kalinin front for a fresh assault. So the Stavka allocated it more transport aircraft to get supplies in by air. It was all part of the build-up to a new offensive, codenamed Operation Mars. In November 1942, the Red Army planned to encircle German forces at Stalingrad in Operation Uranus. Mars would be a simultaneous hammer blow at Rezhev that would prevent the Wehrmacht sending reinforcements south. Zhukov, who had been in the south acting as the Stavka's representative on the Stalingrad front, would return north to command Operation Mars personally. The offensive would be carried out by Konyev's Western Front and the Kalinin Front, now commanded by General Maxim Pokayev. Zhukov would oversee them both. 
The Red Army would attack with 660,000 men and 2,000 tanks. It was clear that Zhukov hoped for a significant breakthrough. On the first day of the operation, a harsh wind blew from the southwest, bringing heavy grey clouds. Wet snow fell from the sky. Visibility was down to 20 yards. Zhukov and Konyev had placed great emphasis on close air support, but nothing could fly in this weather. There was no question of postponing the attack. On the west side of the Rezhev salient, one Soviet mechanized corps broke through the positions of a Luftwaffe field division, while Katakov's third mechanized corps advanced along the Luchesi Valley. Model and von Kluger committed all their forces to the battle. Supreme High Command reserves were now en route to Army Group Center from Smolensk. From the east of the salient, Soviet tanks and cavalry briefly cut the railway line to Rezhev. But with the help of an armoured train, the Germans threw them back. The Red Army sent wave after wave into the attack. But the German defences were well organised and held by well-armed, experienced troops. Soviet losses were enormous. But the German high command foresaw disaster. If defences around Belia crumbled, the whole salient could be cut off and destroyed. The fighting in the Lucchesi Valley would prove critical. Here, the Germans finally managed to contain the Soviet advance. Far to the south, Field Marshal von Manstein was preparing an offensive to rescue German forces trapped at Stalingrad. It was codenamed Operation Winter Storm. But there were serious concerns that it lacked the strength to break through to Stalingrad. When von Manstein asked for more divisions, he was told no. The strategic reserve had already been committed at Rezhev. As Operation Mars continued, German infantry fought a bloody struggle in freezing conditions for a handful of vital highways and railway lines. Elite German units who fought here would remember these months as the worst of the entire war. Katukov's third mechanized corps was just two kilometers short of cutting the highway to Rezhev. He was down from 270 tanks to just 70. But Operation Mars could go no further. By the 20th of December, the offensive had ground to a halt. The Red Army was still outmatched by the Wehrmacht. Although in some arenas, such as sniping, the Soviets were highly proficient, they still lacked crucial capabilities. Many lives were being wasted in repeated frontal attacks on German strongpoints. Their tanks and infantry still hadn't learned to work together effectively. The Red Army often lacked good intelligence of enemy forces. One captured Soviet officer told the Germans he'd been shocked when their reserves arrived. A German intelligence report picked up this point. The enemy wasn't counting on these troops appearing. No German reserve forces are marked on any of the Soviet maps we've recovered. Soviet statistics put casualties for Operation Mars at 216,000. They may have been much higher. German 9th Army casualties 
were 53,000. Von Kluger, commander of Army Group Center, was awarded the Oak Leaf Cluster to his Knight's Cross. But in secret, the field marshal was already plotting against Hitler. In July 1944, von Kluger was in France commanding the Western Front when von Stauffenberg tried to blow up the Führer at his headquarters in East Prussia. When it became clear the plot had failed, von Kluger took a cyanide pill. He was succeeded by his former subordinate, Walter Model, who would also later commit suicide to avoid Soviet war crimes charges. There were no medals for the Red Army commanders. Konyev was relieved of command, but he was soon back in favor. He later led the first Ukrainian front into Germany and Berlin. The commander of the Kalinin front, Maxim Pokayev, was reassigned to the Far East, where he remained for the rest of the war. Operation Mars was a bloody defeat for the Red Army, and it was a personal failure for Marshal Zhukov. For these reasons, the events were largely ignored by Soviet historians and are hardly known in the West. But despite the enormous casualties, the offensive did achieve something. Army Group Center's reserves had been pinned down at Rajev. It meant they had not been available to assist von Manstein's rescue operation at Stalingrad. General Model's 9th Army had suffered heavy casualties too. These were experienced officers and men that Germany would struggle to replace. In January 1943, Veliki Luki was liberated, a town 250 kilometers west of Rajev. The loss of this important transport hub hampered German supply and put the Rajev salient in an even more precarious situation. On the 26th of January, 1943, von Kluger requested permission to withdraw from the Rajev salient. Five days later, Paulus surrendered at Stalingrad. Hitler, suddenly anxious to avoid another encirclement, gave von Kluger permission to retreat. Ninth Army would be vulnerable as it withdrew from the salient, so its staff had begun planning the retreat even before Hitler's permission came through. The result was codenamed Buffalo, a massive operation to move 365,000 men to new prepared positions 100 kilometers to the rear. As the Germans prepared to withdraw, they launched a large-scale anti-partisan operation. They rounded up Red Army stragglers and many innocent civilians too. All faced swift and summary punishment. A corporal from the 4th Panzer Division described how such operations were conducted. Our patrol arrested an old man and six-year-old boy carrying potatoes and salt. They claimed they were going fishing, but they were obviously delivering food to the partisans. We didn't detain them for too long. We sent them on their way to paradise. In the East, such crimes had become commonplace. Now, as the Germans retreated, Modell gave orders to deport all males of working age confiscate all food supplies, poison wells, and burn villages. For these actions, he would be declared a war criminal by the USSR. The German retreat began on the 1st of March, 1943. Engineers waited to blow the Volga Bridge after the last unit had crossed. Hitler had demanded to hear the explosion for himself. It was carried by telephone line back to Führer headquarters. Across no man's land, a Russian medic noticed something was up. A strange silence filled the air. Not a sound, neither from the German side nor ours. 
Slowly, our men left their trenches. More and more of those daredevils with every minute. Then I heard a cry. Fritz has run away. The German withdrawal was conducted in stages. In their wake, they left landmines and booby traps. Modal's scorched earth policy spared nothing. When the Red Army liberated Viasma, they found total devastation. Every building had been demolished or gutted. Every telegraph pole had been cut down. Every railway point smashed. Even oil drums had been riddled with bullets. German soldiers spoke of having left Rejev undefeated. But the reality was that they were retreating to avoid a second Stalingrad. The battles of Rejev saw some of the most ferocious futile bloodletting of the entire war. Red Army casualties were estimated at 1.2 million. The only recompense was that the Germans too had suffered appallingly. On the 3rd of April 1943, Modell was awarded the swords to his Knight's Cross. He was also told to prepare his 9th Army for a new offensive, Operation Citadel. The general had no illusions about the prospects for this new offensive. His forces, although nominally large, contained many units worn down and exhausted by the long winter fighting. Now, they were to be thrown into the white heat of the Battle of Kursk.